right, it's so good to see everyone here tonight. Tonight will be our last series with Russ. I think on behalf of Bob and myself, I can say it's just been such a joy to have Fran and Russ with him. And Bob, I've already planted a bug in his ear for next year. <laughs> so it's been wonderful having him here to uh, just uh, help us to stimulate us to think about uh, evangelism. Uh, those that we need to remember, continue to remember the week's family and the passing of Dorothy this past week. Uh, she will be sadly missed. Uh, Ernie Dickens, we want to continue to remember him. Uh, Stacy is at home, saw her doctor today, one of the doctors, and is out doing as about as uh, well as can be expected. Uh, Pam Fisher is uh, continuing with her therapy. Uh, of course, Diane's here tonight. I see her. She's having, still having some heart issues, so we want to keep her in mind. Uh, talk to Debbie or uh, Cindy today that uh, Debbie is doing well at Regency Hospital in Alexis. However, she has about two more weeks to be in there, so they will have to be looking for another facility to move her to. But she says overall she's doing much better and that her kidneys are functioning again, so prayers are being answered there. Uh, Fran Langlois re, uh, is at home, uh, still recovering. I talked to John today and uh, having uh, maybe some slight uh, indication of maybe some more uh, medical problems. So we definitely want to remember Fran. Uh, also John as he's at home caring for her. Uh, did uh, River come home yet or is she still in the NICU? Still in the NICU? Okay, we want to remember uh, her as she's still in the NICU and especially for uh, Jesse and Sierra as, as difficult as that is to uh, not be able to uh, have your loved one to be held closely. Glad Carson is doing well and uh, glad that uh, the effects from COVID that he's feeling better I uh, want to continue to remember Larry ba Baker. He's having some issues with uh, uh, still uh, Deb Barker. I pray for her. Robert Bias had a procedure today. Uh, please be praying that everything comes out well. Of course, Mary Clucky, Jim Derrickson. Dave's here tonight. He had his treatment. He's feeling good, and uh, they're keeping an eye on things. We're grateful for that. Uh, also be praying for Jamie Durr, Janice Holt, continue to remember her and also uh, and the loss of her sister recently. Uh, Mary Noble, I talked to her today. Uh, she's still in a quaint uh, degree of pain and she's thinking about possibly going to the Cleveland Clinic to maybe get a second opinion on her condition. Joy Parker's doing well. Joy has a birthday coming up. I want to say maybe Saturday so I'm sure she would appreciate a card uh, Gwen Schmidt I saw Gwen here uh, Sunday uh, she looked good she says she's feeling good so continue to pray for her I see Dave and Connie here tonight they are both dealing with some issues so uh, remember them um, I always seem to miss somebody so hands did I miss anybody of course, our Vacation Bible School is coming up. Uh, Community Day is coming up this Saturday, correct? And then Vacation Bible School, which is uh, Sunday through Wednesday. And I can only wait to see what's going to happen as this has already been transformed. And thank you to uh, so many people that uh, work behind the scenes to put this together every year to make it a memorable experience for our young people. And uh, we appreciate that so much. There's no other uh, people we need to pray for. Let's uh, pray together and then we'll have some songs. God, thank you for another beautiful day that you've allowed us to live. Father, we're mindful of the week's family and the passing of Dorothy. I pray, Father, that you'll be with them as it's difficult in the days and the weeks and the months to follow at the loss of a loved one. Our grateful Father Dorothy lived a faithful life and that uh, she has received her crown 
of righteousness. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to pattern our life after Dorothy as she patterned hers after you. Father, we just pray for so many that are on our list that we need to pray for, for Ernie Dickens, for Stacy Duncan, for Pam Fisher. Pray for Diane as she's having some heart issues that it won't be anything serious. Pray for Debbie Hyman. We're grateful for the progress she has made, Lord, and be with Goldie and Cindy as they minister to her. Be with Fran, Father, and help her as she's had some uh, setbacks and just bless her, Father, and be with John as he takes care of her and, and help him, Father. We pray, Father, that uh, River may be able to come off the oxygen soon, that she'll be able to come home, and that Jesse and Sierra might be able to uh, be the parents that they want to be. We pray that you'll bless them, Father, when she does come home, and you'll bless them with wisdom and guidance. Because sometimes, Father, there's uh, feelings of uh, overwhelmingness as to take care of one that is so young. But bless them, Father, give them wisdom. Father, we're grateful that Carson has made good progress. We're grateful that the COVID did not cause any lasting effects. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to be with Larry Baker and Deb Barker. And uh, Father, we pray for Robert. Pray that the procedure that was done today will come out favorable and that you will bless him and uh, his family. Pray that you'll continue to be with Mary Clucky, who's had so many ups and downs, Lord. Pray that you'll give her a stable period that she might be able to enjoy life. Father, we pray for our brother Jim Derrickson in Florida. We pray, Father, that you'll bless him as he is struggling with his health. We know, Father, that he is not where he needs to be. We pray, Father, that you'll give him strength every day and help him to do the things that he would like to do. Father, we're grateful for Brother Dave, and it's such an encouragement to be here and help him, Father, in his medical struggles and uh, be with Janie and, and uh, help him. Pray for Janice Holt and pray that you'll be with her, Father. Pray that you'll be with Mary Noble. I know she's in a great deal of pain, Father. I just pray, if possible, that uh, she might be able to uh, be able to get a second opinion and somehow be out of the debilitating pain that she is in. Father, I pray that you'll be with our sister Joy and that you'll bless her, particularly if she has a birthday in a few days, and be with her. Father, I'm grateful that Gwen was able to be here Sunday. Pray that you'll bless her. Father, it's good to see Dave and Connie here tonight. I know they continue to struggle with some medical issues and just bless them, Father, and help everything to work out. And Father, we just pray for our upcoming community day. We pray, in fact, Father, that uh, uh, we can plant many seeds for your kingdom. We pray for VBS, Father, also that's coming up. We pray, Father, that many seeds will be planted and that the gospel will be uh, impressed upon young minds. We pray, Father, that uh, many youngsters will show up. We're so grateful, Father, for so many in this congregation who sacrificed to make that happen. Father, we're just so grateful for everything you do for us on a daily basis. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Through Emmanuel's ground, 
right. We're marching through Emmanuel ground to Pharaoh, world's on high, to Pharaoh, world's on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion on the beautiful city of God. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord, we sing glory. To the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, to the Lord. At this time, let's enjoy our classes. Testing, testing. One, two, three. Testing, testing. Is that on? Can you hear me? Is my mic on now? Yes? Shake your head. Yeah. All right. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Josh, you're cool as a my car. And uh, we went fishing Saturday, and I took a cooler home full of fish. So. I give you the cooler tonight after, okay? And then do I pick it up Saturday full? No, no. <laughs> we had a, we had a lot of fun. Um, it's so good to be here this summer. Thank you, kitchen crew. Who are you? Where are you? Laura, tell everybody to stand up. Where are they? Oh, some are teaching. I know, but others help. Wasn't it a great summer? A food? Oh, man, that's great. And we always enjoy coming down here. We thank you so much for preparing the meals for us. Thank you, Terry. Where's Terry? Sitting right back there. She's got a bunch of the lessons that we used when we went through in packets of three, right? So that you have a series in your hand when you walk out of here. So you can have a Bible study with somebody. Just have them sit down, open the Bible to a verse, let them read the verse, ask them to read the question. That's all there is to it. And the last question is, you, are you ready to be baptized now? Now, I don't want you to become uh, discouraged because if I've done this 10,000 times, I've only maybe baptized 2,000. So you, you, it, it's about 2 and 10. You know, you have Bible studies with 10 people. Maybe 2 or 3 will be baptized. But you have to leave that to the Lord. And, and sometimes they'll be baptized later. You know, so just 
don't get discouraged. Don't get disappointed. Keep looking for people. And uh, it's been a blessing to have Andy taking care of me. Bill tells me he's helping him back there. Thank you, Andy. I always get here and I look at my PowerPoint and I say, man, that looks good, doesn't it? A lot better than when I sent it to him. He always does a good job with this. So thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. And thank you for having us this summer. Fran, we've enjoyed coming here, haven't we? Every week it's been a blessing. This is our last week. We love getting together and seeing all of you. It's really been a blessing. Um, I want to share something with you. Uh, it's Bringing people to Jesus is as easy as golfing. I golfed this morning at 7 o'clock, and, I, and some guy was behind me, and I had an opening, so I said, you want to golf with me? And he, he came up. His name was Jake. His wife's name was Megan. Got to know them. They're teachers. So we got the summer off. So they're coming to church with us Sunday, and we're going out for dinner with us, Fran. I don't know if you knew that or not. We've got a potluck, don't we, Sunday? Oh, okay, I'll talk to Jake. So, Anyway, it's as easy as inviting somebody to worship and then say, we'll take you out to lunch after, you know? So, and we have a potluck, so they can stay for the potluck. Um, it's so easy, though, to reach out to people. And there's a lot of people searching. They're looking out there. And what did Jesus tell us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? We're to be his witnesses. Jesus doesn't say go out and have Bible studies with people. He says, be my witness. Tell them what he's done in your life. Share with them what he's meant for you, how he's helped you through trouble, how he's helped you with problems, with health problems, with family problems. Just share it with them, and they'll want to know what you have that they don't have. So just share it with them, okay? Now, this is one of the aspects tonight. Um, I don't know if that handout's ready to be handed out, but uh, would you please hand that out for me, Bill? Thank you. It's back there. On a, I, wanted to, I wanted to handle the problems and questions that come up in Bible study. Because so far, uh, no, not those, the, the white one. There you go. Hand those out, and you can fill in the blanks as we go through the outline on the, on the PowerPoint presentation. But uh, it's very simple to do this and to go through this because you're going to have answers to questions. Do you know what most people have questions about? It's baptism. I don't know why. Um, I have baptized professors and professional athletes, National Hockey League. I'm about to baptize a, an NBA referee, but they all have a problem with getting in the water. I don't know what that is. Some of them think, I've already been baptized, so I don't have to be rebaptized. We're going to handle that tonight. But what was the, one of the first questions on the pink lesson when we started was, the last question is, have you been baptized? Yes. How were you baptized? Immersed? Were you saved before or after baptism? 99.9% .9 of the people say, I was saved before baptism. It gives you a perfect opportunity when you get done and you ask them, are you ready to be baptized? They say, I've already been baptized. And I, I always say, well, let's go back to the first lesson. Were you saved before or after the baptism? Now, after they go through a series of lessons, they'll say, oh, I know we're saved after baptism because they filled it in on the sheet. But they felt differently at the beginning. So they have to think about that option. Why was I saved before my baptism? When the Bible says we're saved after our sins are washed away in the baptistry. So that's a question that's going to come up. So we want to handle those questions. Now, to me, <clears throat> I see the greatest problem in the home. We have to raise our children around the dinner table so that they understand what it's like to be a follower of Jesus and how to bring people to Christ and how to evangelize the world. And I'll never forget this speech that President Reagan gave the last night that he was in office in 1986. I want you to listen. It's just about a three-minute speech, but I want you to listen to what he said. My fellow Americans, this is the 34th time I'll speak to you from the Oval Office and the last. We've been together eight years now, and soon it'll be time for me to go. But before I do, I wanted to share some thoughts some of which I've been saving for a long time. We the people tell the government what to do. It doesn't tell us. We the people are the driver. 
The government is the car, and we decide where it should go, and by what route, and how fast. Almost all the world's constitutions are documents in which governments tell the people what their privileges are. Our constitution is a document in which we, the people, tell the government what it is allowed to do. We, the people, are free. This belief has been the underlying basis for everything I've tried to do these past eight years. But back in the 1960s, when I began, it seemed to me that we'd begun reversing the order of things, that through more and more rules and regulations and confiscatory taxes, the government was taking more of our money, more of our options, and more of our freedom. I went into politics in part to put up my hand and say, stop. I was a citizen politician, and it seemed the right thing for a citizen to do. I think we have stopped a lot of what needed stopping, and I hope we have once again reminded people that man is not free unless government is limited. There's a clear cause and effect here that is as neat and predictable as a law of physics. As government expands, liberty contracts. There is a great tradition of warnings in presidential farewells. And I've got one that's been on my mind for some time. But oddly enough, it starts with one of the things I'm proudest of in the past eight years. The resurgence of national pride that I called the new patriotism. This national feeling is good, but it won't count for much, and it won't last unless it's grounded in thoughtfulness and knowledge. An informed patriotism is what we want. And are we doing a good enough job teaching our children what America is and what she represents in the long history of the world? And as for those who create the popular culture, well-grounded patriotism is no longer the style. Our spirit is back, but we haven't re-institutionalized it. We've got to do a better job of getting across that America is freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of enterprise and freedom is special and rare. It's fragile. It needs production. So we've got to teach history based not on what's in fashion, but what's important. Why the pilgrims came here, who Jimmy Doolittle was, and what those 30 seconds over Tokyo meant. You know, four years ago, on the 40th anniversary of D-Day, I read a letter from a young woman writing to her late father, who had fought on Omaha Beach. Her name was Lisa Zanata Hen, and she said, we will always remember, we will never forget what the boys of Normandy did. Well, let's help her keep her word. If we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. I'm warning of an eradication of that, of the American memory that could result ultimately in an erosion of the American spirit. Let's start with some basics more attention to American history, and a greater emphasis on civic ritual. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do. And so, Goodbye, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. I think we've gotten away from the dinner table, you know? We don't get it. And that is that we have to begin teaching our children about all the events in the world that they need to hear about from us, not from anybody else, but from us. Spend more time with our kids. Teach them about Jesus. Teach them around the dinner table. That's one of the best places, isn't it? What's the dinner table like? Okay, Russell, what did you do today at school? Nothing. Heather, what, what did you do? Nothing. <laughs> so you have to talk to them and get them to talk to you and, and hold them to it and, and really get into dialogues about things, especially about the Lord and the church and, and people that you're affecting and people that you're reaching out to and praying for people. I, I mentioned just a moment ago Jake and Megan. I want you to pray for Jake and Megan because they're searching, and I want to get a Bible study with them. So I, I'm hoping that they'll be at church Sunday. I'm praying for that, and they seem ready today, but we'll see. But you never know. And then I need, we need to talk to 
to our children about it. Our president called us back to the dinner table to talk about issues. We've got to teach our children about this because they need to start learning how to reach out to people and, and help them come to Jesus. And they have to be inundated with that so it becomes a perme permeates who they are so that they can share it with other people. Well, this evening I want to talk to you about this issue of is baptism necessary because this is the question that comes up more often than any other question whenever I'm having a Bible study. And usually it, be, it comes at the end of a Bible study because people are wondering about these issues about baptism being necessary. So look at your outline. I want us to look at the idea of what this is all about when we talk about baptism and all the problems that it, it, it presents to us. Jesus is the light of the world. Satan is the darkness. The devil has created a fog of confusion around one of Jesus' most important verses. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, the thought is they have to understand when we have our studies that this is one of the primary situations we need to look at in the Bible. Jesus said he who believes and the word conjunction and is baptized will be saved. What's the world teaching? He who believes is saved. He who believes is saved. That's not what Jesus said, is it? Shake your head no. It's not what he said. And so they, they forget that you have to do both. When the Bible says you have to believe in one chapter, and then it says you have to be baptized in another, and it says you have to repent in another verse, uh, which one do we believe? All of them, that's right. We have to believe all of them, don't we? We can't take one verse. Therefore, their, their favorite verse is Acts 16, 31. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Ah, they take that right out of there. I see it on the roof of a church building on the way down to Comerica Park on the expressway. He who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. That's what you hear it constantly, constantly, constantly. But in the very next verse... The jailer, Philippian jailer, and his family were baptized immediately. So yeah, you can be saved if you believe, but there are other things you have to do in other verses. We have to take all the conglomeration of all the verses. And Satan is trying to take that out of the Bible. And I'm telling you, it's happening. So we have to be careful about that. It's an easily understood sentence, this sentence by Jesus right here. Very simple, but Satan has a pocket full of objections. Objection number one on your outline, if you're following along, and that is, when we look at it, Mark 16, 16 should not be included in the Bible. Have you ever heard that one? Oh, yeah. They, they'll, they'll jump on that. It's not supposed to be included in the Bible, because if you look at the NIV and some of the other translations, ESV and others, there's a little footnote down there saying that chapter 16, verse 9, to the end of, the, end of that chapter, it wasn't in some of the earlier trans manuscripts. And so they're saying that shouldn't be included there. And what's interesting about that is uh, my professors believe it should be. And I did a lot of research on this. And so Mark 16, 16 is found in more than 5,000 ancient manuscripts. Irenaeus quoted it in the early AD 170. Now, uh, if you don't know what a manuscript is, usually it's scholars, when they're writing, they just put MS, which means manuscript. Because uh, manuscripts in ancient times were written on papyrus. And papyrus is a uh, paper that they made in Egypt from the reeds of the Nile. And they would cut down the reeds and flatten them and, and put stones on them, and the, and the insides of the reeds would come out, and it acted like glue. And then they put another layer of reeds going this way on top of these reeds, and then they put stones on it and let it rest there, and they would, they would paste them together. So two layers, this is two layers of reeds, and you can do anything you want. Papyrus is very, very resilient. You can do anything you want. This is from Mount Sinai. We bought it at, at Mount Sinai. It's just some papyrus with the Ten Commandments on it. But you can buy these any place in Egypt especially. They make papyrus a lot. But it's very durable, very pliable. Uh, it's old. This is, wow, this is when I went with Paul and Ruth um, and Ernie 
to the Holy Land, and it's probably 1985, I think. And it's, it, it's amazing how resilient it is. You can do anything you want to it. I show it all the time to my classes at Rochester College. The students pass it around, so you would think it'd be torn up by now, wouldn't you? When you give it to a student. Uh, but this is what papyrus is. And I want to pass that around. Take a look at that. That's what papyrus is. That's just two layers of reeds from the Nile River that are, uh, that are squished together, and they, uh, the stuff inside of it uh, glues them together. It's very durable. But I want you to notice that it's found in 5,000 ancient manuscripts. 5,000 ancient manuscripts. Now, one of the things that happens when you see papyrus and you see documents from ancient times, they're pretty beat up sometimes. Uh, when you go to University of Michigan, they call a, they have a vault room, and they brag about the University of Michigan has the best collection of manuscripts and scrolls in the Western Hemisphere. That's what they brag. Now, if you want to see the best collection of scrolls and manuscripts in the world, you have to go to the British Museum. But the University of Michigan says, oh, we have the best collection of manuscripts in the Western Hemisphere. They think they really have something, you know. Uh, but you can go into the vault room, and they keep it at 70 degrees, and they put all the manuscripts of the New Testament out on a, on a desk, and you can walk around the room. And I took a group of uh, ministers, uh, probably 15 or 20 ministers, uh, every year we went to the vault room, because they'll open it up, the librarian will open it up for you. And they had an actual, uh, on a stand, they had <clears throat> an original King James Version Bible from 1611 sitting there and you could walk up there they tell you not to touch it but when the, she was not looking I touched the King James Bible <laughs> my, my acid from my fingers probably eat through it right now but I always used to tell the ministers uh, this year when we go don't forget those manuscripts are a year older they're getting older every year but they're so old and it's a great collection of manuscripts. If you ever want to go, just call the University of Michigan Library. They'll schedule a tour for you. And you can go with ministers if you want. But this is what the, we want to note, that 5,000 ancient manuscripts. That's a lot of an manuscripts. And the two well-known manuscripts uh, are the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus at the bottom of the page. They had these these verses added at the bottom of the pages in these manuscripts. So even the Vatican, they have a scroll with uh, the book of Mark and that those verses are at the end. And the scroll they found at Mount Sinai in a, in a monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai. You can still go there and see this at the foot of Mount Sinai. And we saw it in 1999. And uh, that the Sinaiticus uh, scroll is highly regarded, just like the Vaticanus. At the Vatican, they have a scroll too. So they still have, and those are at the bottom of the page. So somebody believed that it needed to be in the Bible. And their value is compelling and comparing more than those manuscripts that we look at. Uh, these two are dating back to the fourth century too, as when we look at it, the Ascension, and we see that each one of them is very important. Now. Mark 16, 16 is found in the ancient manuscripts. And one, uh, one other scripture omitted are parts of the Lord's Supper, most of John 8 and the Ascension in Luke 24, 51. So there are textual variants. There are several verses. There's one in Acts chapter 8 as well. I think, I think it's verse 37. That were not in some manuscripts, but they were in many, many others. So somebody's going to say, well, look, Mark 16, 6, uh, 16, verse 9 to the end of the chapter shouldn't be in the Bible. Yes, it should. Most of the scholars have accepted it and believe it should be at the end of the book of Mark. And if you can't find it there, if you want to disregard Mark 16, you can go to another verse and find the same thing. Acts 2.38, 1 Peter 3.21, uh, Galatians 3.27, and you can find the same remarks about salvation. Satan would love to leave Mark 16, 16 out of the Bible. The Holy Spirit put it in, okay? He wants to leave it out because he doesn't want to see people give their lives to Jesus and be baptized to have their sins washed away or to be saved. So that's, that's why when you hear somebody that confronts you about Mark 16, 
remember this lesson because the Bible is complete with the end of Mark. Try going to the book of Mark sometime and reading to verse 9 where they say it should end. It doesn't make sense. The last verse says, the women went back and they were confused and upset. Is that a way to end the gospel? No. That's why verses 9 and following should be in Scripture. Well, when we look at this, objection number two is baptism is unessential because baptism is not repeated in the second clause. Did you hear it? He that is, believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that doesn't believe will be damned or condemned. Why doesn't he say he that doesn't believe and is not baptized will be damned? Does Jesus have to repeat both of those things? He doesn't, does he? And I just heard this in a teenage class that I was teaching in May. No, April. I was teaching a class, and one of the teenagers brought that up. Oh, why doesn't he say, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved? He that doesn't believe and is not baptized shall be damned. Does Jesus have to say both of those articles? He doesn't, does he? The Bible doesn't require that. In fact, let's look at it. Some say only faith is required because Jesus did not say is not baptized shall be condemned. And so when they're looking at Mark 16, 16, they don't believe that Jesus quoted it correctly. He should have said, if you don't believe and you're not baptized, you'll be damned, you'll be condemned. But that's not what we look at. When we look at this verse, suppose Noah said, he who believes in the flood and enters the ark will be saved, but he who does not believe shall be drowned. He left out entering the ark, didn't he? Isn't that true? He should have said, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't believe in the flood and you don't get in the ark, you'll drown. He didn't have to say that, did he? Because if you don't believe, you're not going to get in the ark. And that's why Jesus doesn't have to require a, a requirement of saying both of those. To be condemned, it is unnecessary to refuse both belief and baptism. While both are required to be saved, refusing only one results in being lost. You can leave out either one of those and be lost. Jesus said, believe and be baptized to be saved. You can believe only and you're lost. You can be baptized only and you're lost. And that's very difficult. I had a study this past winter, I think it was February, with a man who was baptized as a baby, sprinkled as a baby, and said, I was baptized as a baby. And after going, uh, we didn't even have to go into sprinkling and finding that yet. We hadn't gone to Romans chapter 6 yet. And we were talking about, well, what kind of baptism? Jesus says you have to believe and be baptized to be saved. Which one of those comes first, belief or baptism? Belief. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Jesus said you have to believe first. So said Adrian, which one comes first? He said, well, belief. And I asked him, I said, uh, did you believe when you were sprinkled? He said, no. That cleared up a lot of problems in that Bible study. He realized his first baptism was a new point. It wasn't following the requirements of what Jesus said. And that's why you have, to, you have to carefully follow the Bible. That's why Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Which one comes first? Repent. So those are issues, I think, that take care of themselves. We didn't even have to talk about sprinkling yet. We talked about burial when we got to Romans chapter 6. And then he realized the sprinkling was a moot point all the way because it wasn't the correct type of baptism. So, just believing and refusing only one, either believing or being baptized, is lost. You have to do both. Jesus didn't say, he that believes shall be saved. He didn't say, he that is baptized will be saved. He said you have to do both. And so we have to teach the same thing. Objection number three. Any questions before we go on? I know I'm going fast, but I want to get to another section quickly, too. It doesn't matter what one believes about baptism, only that one believes in Jesus. That's another one. You just have to believe in Jesus and you're saved. Wait a minute. 
what does the Bible say? It doesn't say anything about just believing and be saved in Jesus' words, in the red letters in Mark 16. Two contradictory statements. Baptism is necessary. Baptism is unnecessary. Both can't be true, can they? Shake your head no. It's either necessary, it's not necessary. Jesus said it's necessary. So we don't argue with Jesus. That's the beauty of this lesson series is just teach it to let them read it. They will not disagree with Jesus. I guarantee you when you get into this study, they'll say, I'm going to listen to what Jesus says. They don't care what I say. They don't care what Mark says. They don't care what Sarah says. They want to see what the Bible says. That's what's important. Okay, we can't separate believing in Jesus from believing in Jesus' teaching, and that includes baptism. So you can't take all the, all the things that Jesus talked about and taught, accept baptism and throw that out. You can't do that. You have to accept all of it or none of it. Objection number four, baptism is a work, and man cannot be saved by works. Somebody tell me the verse that says that baptism is a work. I can't find it. Do you know I had a young person out, out in the lobby? Where's the lobby, Bob? Is it back there? Okay. I'm lost. I think it's back there or something. I had a young man. He was probably in his 20s. He said that baptism was a work, so he didn't have to be baptized. And I said, oh, Andy, not this Andy, another Andy. Andy, can you show me that verse? He said, no, not really. I said, Boy, if you could find it, I would love to see it. Because the Bible doesn't say baptism is a work. You can't find that. But the problem is, we submit to baptism. We don't do it. Somebody else baptizes us. Mark? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't make sense, does it, Mark? That's a good point. Confe go back to that. Did you hear what he said? If, if, if baptism is a work, confession's a work. And we know that's not a work. So people twisting these things, the Bible's so plain and simple and so easy to understand. Good example, I like that. Both baptism and faith are works of obedience, but neither is a work original by man. We don't work for baptism. It's something that we let someone do to us. Um, I baptized a lady here in this congregation. Oh, man. Man, what year was that? Whew, it was a long time. It was back in the 1900s, way back. And I baptized a lady here. And uh, I'll never forget. It was probably the, I know it was the first year, so it was, you know, I think we had like 59 baptisms that year, and I think she was like the first dozen or something. And when I baptized her, her wig came off, and the wig was floating around. And I brought her up and grabbed it, stuck it on her head real fast. <laughs> At least the wig was baptized too, you know? Oh, don't tell anybody names. <laughs> I think you're right, though. I think you're right. I didn't remember the name. But did you see it? saw her come off. I didn't think anybody noticed. I was trying to do it quick, you know. Oh, well. So, but this is, she didn't do it. I baptized her, you know. She just let me baptize her into Christ. So it can't be a work. Let's get off that subject. <laughs> I didn't think anybody saw it, Georgia. Salvation is freely given. It cannot be earned. It can't be earned. We, we don't earn our way to heaven. In fact, one of the things that I really am adamant about is that we're baptized not to get to heaven. Now, that's a blessing. But I was baptized because of what Jesus did on the cross. And one of the benefits is going to heaven and being saved. But the motivation needs to be, he did so much for us. 
can't we go under the water? I mean, it's simple. And one of the benefits is you're saved. Your sins are washed away. Both faith and baptism are acts of obedience, but neither is a work original by man. So we know that. Option number five, objection number five. It is baptism in the Spirit, not water, that saves. I've heard people say that. It's not the water. And of course, water regeneration is not true. The water doesn't save us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says that we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38 says we're saved after we're baptized. Now, which one of them is true? Both of them. Peter said one, Paul said the other. So when do we come in contact with the blood, Paul? Paul says when you're in the baptistry. We come in contact with the blood because both of those verses say blood saves us, baptism saves us. They're both true. You want to know when we're saved by the blood of Jesus? In the baptistry, shake your head yes. That's what the Bible says. Both of them together. Okay, what is required for one to become a Christian? Water is commanded. Spirit baptism is not commanded. That was for Acts chapter 2 when the, when the apostles were immersed with the Holy Spirit. Water baptism is ministered by man. Spirit baptism cannot be administered by man. So it's, a di it's two different issues here. And they're going to try, that, that try to say that baptism in the Bible is spirit baptism. And it's not true. Objection number six. Any questions before we go to objection number six? Good, I've got to hurry here. Sinners are saved by faith only, which excludes baptism. Haven't you heard that? Every week, televangelists say, you're saved, just believe. Pray the sinner's prayer with me. You're saved. You have faith. You're saved. And there's a lot of people walking around the world that say, I believe in Jesus. I'm saved. Jesus disagrees with that. We should be careful about using only or alone regarding salvation. To say faith only salvation is wrong because we're using only one, only, alone. And this is why. Salvation is by grace, but not grace alone. You can't say that we're just saved by grace because Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says we're saved by grace. What's the next two words? Through faith. And nobody quotes those next two, words, the next two words. They all say, we're saved by grace. We're saved by grace. We're saved by grace. We're saved by grace. Wait a minute. Finish the sentence. Through faith. That makes a whole difference in the world. Don't misquote Paul by saying we're saved by grace. Through faith. That's what Paul said. What is faith? Faith is working out our belief. It takes action. It, obedient faith, yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And you know what, Mark? Think about Abraham. Would Abraham have, would he be considered the father of the faithful if he hadn't left his home? Yeah. Exactly. You have to believe and act. Exactly. Very good. Okay, so salvation by Jesus' blood is not by Jesus' blood alone, not faith alone, not repentance only, not confession only, and not baptism only. You have to have them all because all of them are mentioned in the New Testament. We can't separate one and just use that one to get to heaven. So that's one of the conditions here. So compare God's doctrine to man's. God's belief plus baptism equals salvation. Man. Belief minus salvation equals minus baptism equals salvation. You see the difference? God is teaching something different than we see on TV in the denominational world. And we have to see the difference there to understand what the Bible's trying to teach us, not what man is trying to teach. Don't listen to that. Listen to the Bible. Objection number seven. I think this is the last one. Is it only seven? Thank you. The thief on the cross was not baptized, so I don't need to be. Wait a minute. How many of you have heard that objection? I've heard it a hundred times, maybe more. Well, Jesus forgave sins without baptism in several cases. Of course, Jesus can save anybody he wants with or without baptism. 
In fact, the paralytic in Mark chapter 2, the sinful woman in Luke 7, the tax collector in Luke 19, and the thief on the cross in Luke 23, 43, they were all saved by Jesus without baptism. Noah was told to build an ark, Abraham to kill a son, the Jews to offer sacrifices, but these do not apply. They all lived under the old law. The thief on the cross, when did he die? Under the old law. Colossians 2.14, canceling out or blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, was contrary to us, took it out of the way, and what did Jesus do? He nailed it to the The thief on the cross died under the old law. He didn't die under the new law. And I, I hear that over and over. And, they go, oh. and the first question to ask him is, what law did Jesus live under? He went to the temple. He observed the Sabbath. He observed the Passover. So we know he lived under the old law. Everybody shake their head, yes. That's what people do. When they realize the thief on the cross didn't have to be baptized. He was living under the old law. So, uh, the New Testament terms were not preached until after the thief's death. So he did not require baptism. I've heard the objection. We don't know if he was. He might have been baptized. We don't know for sure. But he didn't have to be because he lived under the old law. The Great Commission baptism reenacts Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. How could the thief be baptized into Christ's death buried with Jesus and raised with Jesus when he wasn't dead yet. He couldn't. So he didn't have to be baptized because baptism, when we're standing in the baptistry, when we're baptized, it signifies his death, burial, and resurrection. He didn't die yet. Finally, Jesus gave us Mark 16, 16. Let us not allow Satan to take it away. It's there. It's for a purpose. And we can prove it. Now, everybody turn to, oh, we've got about oh, four minutes. Hurry, hurry. Turn in your Bibles. Mar, uh, Acts chapter 18. This is the one thing that produces more baptisms than any verses I've ever taught. If I can get over there eventually. It might take a while. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, let's go to Acts 18, verse 24. And this says, uh, let's start in uh, 1824. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. We know Apollos, who he was. He was a native of Alexandria. That means he's very intelligent because that was a cradle of knowledge. Alexandria, Egypt. They had the largest library of scrolls, manuscripts. Where's my scroll? Here it is. They had 300,000 scrolls, manuscripts, in the library in Alexandria. It was the largest library in the world. If you lived in Alexandria, you were considered a very intelligent, educated person. That's who Apollos was. Let's continue. Did I turn the page on this? Here we go. Uh, he had a thorough, <laughs> he was a learned man and a thorough knowledge of scriptures. Apollos, very intelligent. And he knew the Old Testament scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately Underline the word though. Some versions say but. Though. He only knew of the baptism of John. That's an ominous sentence. But he only knew the baptism of John. He was teaching everything else accurately, but he was only teaching the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. What is that concerning? Baptism. One of the things, I read this one time to a class, and I said, he was speaking boldly in the synagogue, and he was teaching the baptism of Jesus correctly. And they said, well, that's not what the Bible says. I said, you're right. He was teaching something wrong. You know what Priscilla and Aquila did? They stood up and said, hey, you're teaching wrong. Stop teaching. Did they do that? No. What did they do? They invited him to their home. I love that. They didn't embarrass him. 
They didn't cut them down. They didn't cause a problem or a split or disunity. They said, hey, come home with us. And let's talk to them about the true baptism. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him. And so then he went out of the city to Corinth. And in chapter 19, listen to what happened. Paul had to clean up the mess. Chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Now Paul's in Ephesus. Apollos left, now Paul's there. There he found some disciples. What's a disciple? Anybody know what a disciple is? Follower of Jesus. Yeah, somebody that's trying to live like Jesus. It's a follower of Jesus. He found some followers of Jesus. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Here's Paul. Wait a minute. I haven't been here. I didn't start the church here. Who are these guys? He said, I need to qualify them. So he asked them a question. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? See, he backed up. He knew they were disciples. Let me find out about the Holy Spirit. What did they say about the Holy Spirit in the next verse? No, we don't even, we haven't even heard what is the Holy Spirit. Now Paul's thinking, wait a minute. They're disciples of Jesus. They don't know about the Holy Spirit, so he's going to back up again. Wait a minute. Then what baptism did you receive? He said in the next sentence, John's baptism. Paul, everything's going off in his mind now. Okay, now I understand. You're disciples, but you were baptized with John's baptism. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. Now, I always ask this question, and this is the real question that always converts people many times. I'll ask them, what did Paul find? Disciples. What, were they baptized? Yes, they were baptized. They were baptized by John's baptism. They were immersed. Are they saved? Well, let's find out. And then I asked him to read the next verse. What does that say? On hearing this, they were baptized by John. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were rebaptized. You were baptized before. Was it the correct baptism? Do you know what you were doing? Was it to have your sins washed away? Were you saved in your baptism? Or did you put Christ on in your baptism? And many of them, they have no idea. I, I don't know. I don't remember what the guy said when he baptized me. Well, if it's anything else, then Jesus' baptism doesn't work. And this is the verse that really cements it because they'll say, uh... They were baptized. They were rebaptized in the name of Jesus. You see, people need to realize what happened in their baptism so they can really respond to the true gospel. Not John's baptism, not Luther's baptism, not the Catholic Church baptism, not the Baptist Church baptism, Jesus' baptism. This is the verse that really helps. I need to be rebaptized. Let's bow our heads together. Father, thank you so much for our time together this summer. Father, I'm so grateful that, that we have a blessing of being able to study your word and understand all of the issues that are brought up in the Bible with our people that we are bringing to Jesus. Help us, Father, inspire us, lead us to those that need to hear, and help us to open our eyes to the lost each and every day. Father, I just pray that you'll bless us. Be with us as we contact people. I ask you, Father, tonight to be with Jacob and Megan so that we can sit down and tell them about the Lord. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, elders, for letting us come.